Good morning. Thank you so much, Adrian, for giving me a seat. This morning, we'll be preaching from the sermon of uh, Luke chapter 8, because it's a very long passage. So I'll be doing only half of Luke chapter 8, and the ambition side but the other half. So Pastor Chun is doing the other half. Don't worry, we're still getting our full salary. <laughs> but seriously, uh, over the week, if you can, just refer to the podcast so you can continue and know the rest of the passage. And we're doing this in the interest of time, so we can do justice to the passage. And uh, so at week, this weekend, at Adam, you have a pastor who has some hair, and at Bishan, you have a pastor of no hair. And together, we are co-heirs in Christ. <laughs> and one day, God shall sanctify my humor. <laughs> Come, let's go to God in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for lightheartedness. We thank you so much for truly, truly a blessed opportunity for us to open your word. Help us to come humbly before your word and may may your word be planted deeply in our hearts and with patience and perseverance may it bear fruit for your glory. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So before Esther, my wife, and I had kids, every year, my in-laws, they will catch up with my parents. How? So they invite them for one of those dinners at the Mandarin Ministry dinners. So for those who are not familiar, so every year there are a few Chinese festivals. And so the Mandarin Ministry will organize these dinners where you can invite your Chinese-speaking loved ones to hear the gospel. And so, and every year, when my in-laws invited, how can my parents say no? Yeah, so each year after the dinner, my in-laws would kindly send my parents back and we all squeeze into one car. And usually my father is very silent and my mom, she's usually very chatty. And then one year, after a few rounds, she asked me this question. She said, you know, every year, Pastor Yak Chow preaches in Mandarin so hard, though it seems sweating. But are there any effects? Is he successful? And I don't know for what reason, I have no reply to her, so I just told her the story. I told her a parable. So in very simple Mandarin, I told her, Luke chapter 8, verse 5 to 8. And I told her a farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the base of the birds ate it up. And some fell rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. And other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded the crop a hundred times more than was sown. And after I finished telling this story to my mother, guess what? She was completely silent on the way back. First time, the car ride was completely silent. Her lips were not moving, but I could see her brain cranking inside. She was thinking very hard about the story. So what is so powerful about this story? Why did Jesus even teach the story? And how can we apply it to our own lives? So let's look at the context of the passage. Why and when did Jesus tell the story? And to whom did he tell it? Verse 4, So while a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town to town, he told this parable. So verse 4 shows us that a crowd was gathering. So for the geeky ones among us, the Greek grammar says that it's constantly growing, progressively increasing in size. And they're all moving towards Jesus. And obviously, because in the minds of the crowd, Jesus was the greatest act in town. His fame was spreading far and wide. He was drawing crowds wherever he went, like all these big artists They came to Singapore. You know which one, right? Coldplay, Ed Sheeran, Mother Taylor. And in fact, this weekend, this weekend, we have another mega artist. Do you know who? Rod Stewart. You don't know who he is? I don't want to talk about it. How you broke his heart. (laughs) Because we're not here for him, we're here for Jesus. And so for Jesus, you see, there's one big difference. You can never give him a grant 
to come to your town exclusively. Because Jesus moves from town to town, you cannot restrain him. The news that he's bringing, the mission that he's on, about the arrival of the kingdom of God, is too important to be contained to only one town. But in those days, the crowd never knew where he went. So they could only hear say, there's no WhatsApp, no Facebook updates. And so the large crowd will move from town to town, following going to wherever they thought he would be there. And they travel on foot, just to catch a glimpse of Jesus, just to be healed. And so when Jesus saw this huge crowd, his fan base, what did he do? Did he sign autographs? Did he give extra goodies like a tete hat? No. What did he do? He gave them a parable. Huh? He told them the parable of different soils, the one that we just heard. And his disciples went, huh? Verse 9. The disciples asked him what this parable meant. They obviously did not understand the parable, so Jesus explained the parable to his disciples only. Verse 10, he said, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that though seeing, they may not see, though hearing, they may not understand. In other words, even though everyone present heard the parable, only some, the selected few, would understand it. Yeah. To the disciples, Jesus would explain, but to the crowd, they would not receive an explanation. So the parable, my friends, it acts as a filter, as a sieve, something like this that you use for your tea, right? You filter away the tea leaves, and so what you get will be the tea. So it filters one group that could see and understand, and another group that those seeing and hearing could not understand. And so from the quotation box in, chapter, in verse 10, you look in the Bibles, we see that Jesus himself was citing a Bible passage, obviously from the Old Testament. And it's taken from Isaiah 6, verse 9. In the original text of Isaiah, God saw how Israel was unrepentant, always rebelling against him despite multiple, multiple chances of the chances to give them to repent. So God sent a prophet, Isaiah, to preach to them. But because of the hardness of their hearts, they will reject the message. They will be ever hearing, but never understanding, ever seeing, but never perceiving. So in short, Isaiah's ministry was doomed to fail from day one because the condition of the heart of Israel. And this rebellious heart of Israel continues in Israel in the days of Jesus. Luke records for us later in chapter 20, Jesus told another parable to the Jewish religious leaders, and this is what they reacted. This is what they said. The teachers of the law and the chief priests, they looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. In other words, the religious leaders had no trouble understanding the content of the parable, but the stubbornness led them to reject the message. It is not a matter of IQ that you can understand the parable. It here is a matter of the heart. They have already decided to reject the message. And that's why when the parable is spoken, the hearer's response reveals the state of the heart. The parable acts as a filter. But there was a tiny ray of hope. In Isaiah chapter 6, God declares by grace that he will keep a small remnant of Israel. And from this small group, he will raise the Messiah, the ultimate faithful son of Israel. And so this Messiah, Jesus, came. And now he has come to Israel and this huge crowd coming towards him, and he tells them a parable, and they go, huh? Because of the condition of their heart. But by grace and grace alone, Jesus will choose a remnant, a small group from among them, 
to become his disciples so that they can understand and turn and repent. So the big question this morning then is, how? How do we know the condition of our hearts? What are the signs and symptoms showing that we are responding to God's words correctly? And so to this, let us turn to Jesus' explanation of the parable. Verse 11, he said, This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. In this parable, the seed represents the very word of God. Jesus is both the one who proclaims the word from town to town, and he himself is also the word of God that goes town to town. He is the word incarnate. And just as he has shown that he has authority over sin and death, over demons and evil spirits, over natural forces of calamity, his word has full authority over our lives. Why? So I remember that in my youth, um, there's this unexplainable hatred for God in my heart, specifically the Christian God. See, I'll be interested to read anything and everything to find out about other gods, other religions, other spiritual beings, whether it's about Hinduism, Taoism, Buddhism, or Greek mythology. I will devour those books. I will read them. But when somehow, when someone mentioned to me about God, the Christian God, or church, I will shut him down. I will stop the conversation. And I can't explain it. There's an anger, anger that will arise in my heart, and I will despise the person. So one day, I was so yeah, bored, and I, was en- I found a book at the bookshop, and I was enjoying it. Why? It was a book written by an ex-Christian. The author, he was saying how hypocritical the Christians were. And he cited a Bible verse to show that the Christians around him failed to live up to the calling of that verse. Which verse? He gave them chapter 6, verse 32. If you love those who love you, why credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. So the author was quoting the verse to condemn the Christians around him because obviously they never lived up to their standard to the verse. But when I read this verse for the first time, something spoke into my heart. On that day, I gained respect for Jesus. I somehow knew I could not live up to that standard. There was power in God's word, even when handled by an unbeliever. And because it's the same powerful word of God that God spoke, that brought forth life, that brought forth darkness, light into darkness, this same seed, it contains that power to bring forth new life in God. It is the power that can bring forth obedience in those who insist on rejecting God. It is the word of God that God has chosen as the primary means to bring forth new creation from a dying and decay world. Without the word of God, there is no life. Which is why when the devil tempted Jesus to turn stones into bread, he replied, he said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. And Jesus was quoting from Deuteronomy 8 verse 3. It says here, He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach that every man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. In other words, although we need food daily to survive, we need God's word every day more to truly live. Because all the pleasures in the world can never satisfy your souls. And all the worries that we have in our minds can never bring you peace. Because man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And to treat God's word seriously is to recognize its power of nourishment. 
and to recognize the authority of Jesus, that it has authority over our lives. And when we read it, we obey it. This is a seed in the parable. Then there's the other character in the parable, and he's the farmer. And Jesus did not explain who the farmer was, or did not say much about the farmer, simply because in this parable, the farmer is not the one who determines the outcome of the harvest. Why? Because in the Palestinian farmer, he will carry a sack of seeds on his shoulder, and he just walk, and he'll scatter the seeds. And only after he has scattered the seeds, then he will plough the land. It's the other way around. And so the main determining factor, whether the seed will bear fruit, is where the seed lands. Sowing, by the way, is usually done in the months of October and December. And the harvesting, about six months later, in June. There is a time to sow, a time to wait, and a time for harvest. So recently, my wife Esther, she noted that, you know, music, she told me, music has timing. Right? She said that, yeah, you know, there's a beat for all the voices and instruments to play in their own parts, to harmonize with and blend with one another. And if we don't follow the timing, instead of music, we get noise. And also, every party has to play according to his part, in its own timing. Sometimes you don't play, and sometimes you play. But there's also a timing when the verse comes in, when the bridge comes in, when the chorus comes in, and when the climax comes in. If you were to rush through the entire piece of music, you will risk losing the beauty of the song. Music has timing. And so does God's plan for the world and for your lives. Human history is a complex symphony orchestrated by God. We must trust the composer for the perfect timing. We have to trust God's perfect timing for his masterpiece to be played out beautifully. And it's very interesting that Jesus compares human beings to plants. Because like plants, humans grow. And growth takes time. And so this calls for great patience. Great patience when you try to sow the seeds of God's word in the life of others. There is no silver bullet in evangelism. There is no such thing as a magic formula for mission or ministry that we can instantly succeed. No such thing. Instead, we sow and we wait. At the same time, this calls for great patience for us in the church with one another. Because we too are all God's plants. We too will take time to grow. Let us be patient with one another for the person to grow in God's timing. So anyone listen to this parable intensely, just like my mother in the car, will realize that it's the condition of our own heart that determines the fruitfulness of God's word. The fault lies not in the seed, the fault lies not in the farmer, but the fault lies in the soil itself. And so Jesus explained that there are three unfavorable conditions of the soil. Verse 12, he says, The seeds that fell alongside on the path, which is hard and has no soil, and these seeds could not even sprout because they could not grow roots, and they could be easily picked up by the birds. There's simply no chance of bearing fruit. Sometimes people reject the gospel up front simply because it sounds offensive, because it just offends them. Once a lawyer said to me, said, I don't understand you Christians, she said. Don't you think your message is offensive? And so my reply to her is, as a lawyer, I think you will agree that just because something is offensive doesn't make it any less true. And she did not reply. See, feelings have a way of clouding our minds and hardening our hearts. And for those who hear God's word but did not heed it at all, 
The Bible says the devil takes away before they could even believe. This is not a call for being superstitious. This is a call for us to be aware there are spiritual forces. And that we have to realize that we have no strength to save ourselves. So let's not kid ourselves that we have strength to save others. We have to pray for God to soften the hearts. Then in verse 13, that those that fell on rocky ground could not grow for long because it grew only on thin soil, but they could not grow deep roots to sustain the growth. And so such hearers, they hear the good news, but then when tough times come, they fall away, they wither and die. Usually, such hearers come to church or to Christ with an agenda. When they cannot get what they want, they walk away from Jesus. Because Jesus is explaining how we as human beings react to our disappointments and to rejection reveal a lot of our character. And then verse 14, he says, There are seeds that fell in the midst of thorns. Among the other plants, the seeds now have to compete for nutrients with the thorns and the thistle. And so the growth becomes stunted. In Christian terms, the hearts have competing loyalties. Loyalties between God, between your worries, between your pleasures, and between your riches. When our minds are full of worries, or when our thoughts are held captive by fantasies of more wealth or more pleasure, there is no room for heart in our hearts for God. Luke chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus warned, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Following Jesus is not about a balanced lifestyle, that we can have some little portion of worldliness and some portion of spirituality. Instead, it's a call to complete allegiance. In verse 15, believers that find themselves in a lifelong struggle for this allegiance to Christ and Christ alone, that we will find that every day we have to remove the thorns in our lives. They are fighting for competing allegiances so that in our spiritual life, we can finally hear God's word, retain it, and bear fruit. The path of discipleship calls for great endurance and patience. And it's only by persevering that a seed will grow and produce a great crop, even up to a hundred times more than was sown. Verse 15, But a seed on a good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. So at perhaps at this point, you may be wondering, that, so who, who are those with a noble and good heart? What are they like? Am I such a person? So one way to understand who are the noble and good heart is to look at the context where Luke places this chapter. You see, in the parable of soils, it's placed between portraits and portraits of people who receive Christ. And we get a consistent picture that those who are considered to have a noble and good heart are not those who have done great things for God. They are not the religious teachers. They are not the Pharisees. In fact, they are those who are completely broken and desperate. Like who? Like Peter. When he first realized who Jesus was, what did he say? Away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. It's like the sinful woman who came to Jesus, and in his holiness, what could she say? Nothing, but she cried tears. It's like Jairus, whose daughter died. What could he say? Come, Lord, come. And it's like the woman who was bleeding for 12 years. What could she do? She just reached out and touched Jesus. Because, my friends, 
Jesus did not just come to usher in the kingdom of God. He came to turn our notions about God upside down. That only desperate sinners can enter the kingdom of God. And eventually, these are the wise that will bear fruit because of His grace, not the wise that do great things for God. And those who hear God's word with such desperation, retain it in their hearts, and by persevering, they overcome trials and tribulations, the worries and the pleasures of life, and so produce, finally, a crop in their lives. So our next question then is this, how? How does a Christian even persevere in one's faith unto fruitfulness? So maybe let's have a thought experiment. Now imagine you're shipwrecked and you're on an island, a deserted island, and then some distance away, you saw civilization, right? Buildings, lights, and you're going to find out how you can get off this island without any modern technology, no Wi-Fi, no GPS, nothing. So there are three possible options. Option A, if you are fitter than me, you can start to swim, right? You can say, maybe I'll swim from this island towards the mainland, and that will take a lot of effort and you swim, and, but you might not last the journey, depending on how strong a swimmer you are. This type of spirituality is what we call the Superman Christianity. I'll do anything for God. I'll push, push, push. I'll work so hard. I'll try, try, try. It must happen. And so you give all your energies trying to produce fruit for God. But eventually, inevitably, you will reach a point where you'll run out of strength. And then you try solution B. Solution B is what we call, you build, you build a raft, right? Just take a few planks of wood, put together one sampan and seal it. And then you pray, and you pray, and you hope that the waves will somehow move you in the correct direction. In the wrong direction, too bad, wrong paradise. Right? So this is what we call the let go and let God spirituality. And in some sense, it's an overcorrection of the first kind. Right? Because you're so disappointed, you ran out of strength, say, ah, I don't care, let God, let, what, what, what God has to do? I don't care anymore. But there's a third way. The third way is to build a raft, but with sails. You use the wind to power your raft, but you use your sail to control the direction. This is the grace-empowered spiritual life. Allow me to quote from my lecturer, Graham Senton, and he says this, There is effort in hoisting sails, but the effort is not what is making the yacht go forward. It is the wind that makes the difference. Remember, you can hoist the sails. The hoisting itself will not make the move the ship go forward. It is the wind that blows and makes the difference. The effort to hoist the sails is to listen to God's word carefully and to pray for all things. It is done with the recognition that we cannot save ourselves or save others. It is done out of our need, our desperate need for God's grace and power to persevere day by day. Just to survive one more day, you need His grace. Only then will there be a harvest in your lives. Verse 15, But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart, who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. So then, of course, the last question is, what is at stake? Why do we even bother to persevere? I thought we are safe, right? Why bother? So just a few weeks back, I went for my usual uh, six-monthly dental appointment. You know what they say? The two, two, two for your dental health. You brush your teeth twice a day, two minutes each time, and see the dentist two times a year. Ah. So I went to see my dentist, and the moment I opened my mouth, the dentist asked gently, say, have you been flossing your teeth? And so as a Christian, I shouldn't lie to my dentist. So I said, well, no. Then with my mouth open, I was quite embarrassed. I asked her, is it that obvious? And then she burst out laughing. Ah, ha, 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 la, 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 la. So, so loud, not so embarrassing. Yes, it is that obvious I haven't flossed my teeth. Verse 17, 
For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed, and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Jesus explained in verse 16 to 17 what is a stake. That he is the light of the world. He has come to shine away all the darkness, to draw people into that beautiful light. The light is ever increasing. And when he returns, it will be very obvious those who have heard the word, the, enjoy the light and persevered with the word of God. You can't hide. It is that obvious. And so how shall we then retain God's word? With a spirit of humility. The last thing we want here in church is to judge one another based on how much time you read your Bible today or how many passages you can understand. Because this is not the quantity that comes. It is the quality of our reading that matters. Verse 18, Therefore, consider how carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they think they have will be taken from them. In other words, we are how? We are to humble ourselves before God's word, to hunger for it. And regardless how many or how little words you read, we take it seriously into our lives. And but for those who are proud and they think they know everything and there's nothing more to learn, that whatever they have will be taken away. And with true humility when we read God's word is to recognize His true authority in your lives. Then you will obey it. And that's why it says in verse 21, Jesus replied, My mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. And not only are we called then, my friends, to persevere this way to overcome our trials and tribulations, we are also called to persevere this way to bear fruit for God. Then we can yield a crop for His glory. Allow me to just tell you a story. In 1779, it's the 18th century, a young man called Charles Simeon, and he arrived in Cambridge as a student. So he was not yet a believer, but one day he came across a book where I explained to him that, you know, in the Old Testament, the Jews were taught how to confess their sins and lay their hands on the animal offering. And so they transfer their sins onto the offering, their guilt is transferred, and the animal will die on their behalf. He was filled with so much guilt and fear for his own sins. So Charles wanted to know how he himself could transfer his guilt to someone else. And then it occurred to him why Jesus died on the cross, that we can also transfer our sins on his head, the head of our Saviour, who died for us. Upon this realisation, Charles became a believer. His life changed dramatically, but it also took years, many years for him to work out you know, to deal with his temper and his impatience. You know, once he was so impatient with a servant that he beat him harshly on the back because the servant was slow in working. But he was humble enough to recognize his wrong and apologize. Like all other Christians, it will take time to bear fruit, fruit of God's word in our lives. And so just when he was about to leave the university, he was appointed the preacher. Why? Because the previous one just died and he needed a replacement. So he stayed back to preach. But the congregation there did not want him because they took offence at his messages. They were offended by his sermons on how sinful we are and how much we need God to save us. So during the Sunday church morning service, these people who disliked Charles not only do they not listen to the sermons, they refuse to let other people sit on the pews. So what did the pastor do? He used his own money and he bought chairs and stools and he put besides the pew for people to sit. And what did the church people do? They took those chairs and stools and threw them out 
into the courtyard. Never mind. It's second service. So this morning second service, he tried to preach, but the church leaders hired another preacher to preach to them instead. So effectively shutting it off from the pulpit. Never mind. He start an evening service. He tried starting an evening service, but the church wardens locked up the church doors, and so everybody had to wait outside, could not go in to hear the sermon. And this opposition, how long do you think it lasted? How long do you think you could last? I asked myself this. I don't think I had last more than a week with such a congregation. He lasted not just one year, not just two. He lasted 12 years. Charles endured patiently for 12 years. Humanly speaking, it is so easy for all of us, you realize, to persevere to what? To persevere to hate. It's, all, it's so easy to remember all the wrongs that people have done to us. We just recall them. It energizes us. But it's much harder to persevere to love, to forgive others, to choose to love even those who oppose you. And Charles chose, he chose to persevere to love his church and slowly and surely, love and good deeds, gently he won them over one by one over 12 years. And 12 years later, although he had won over the church, his troubles did not end. Because by now in Cambridge, he has gotten a reputation. And so the students begin to despise him for his preaching. And he was slandered with all sorts of rumours. And then the university lecturers, his colleagues, did not make it any easier. They decided to teach classes on Sundays. So the other students could not attend church service. How long did Charles last in such a ministry? He lasted a total of 49 years. And not only that, his ministry went beyond his lifetime. Two centuries later, in the 20th century, his perseverance inspired others, his writings inspired others, his passion for missions inspired others. Who? He inspired Charles Spurgeon and other Charles. He inspired John Stott many years later. They all went back to his perseverance. So why? Why did Charles Spurgeon even continue to persevere? And he explained. He said, pastors, or like Christians, we are like lighthouses. Lighthouses in the darkness of the night. You have to keep the lighthouse shining. Because if not, there will be shipwrecks and dead bodies on the coast. When we stop holding out the light of God's word, there will be people who shipwreck their faith for whatever reason. And what about the secret source of strength for such an endurance? His secret was not because he was a great man. His secret is because he served a great God. You see, every morning, even during winter, he would wake up in the morning and study the Bible for four hours. What is how I study? He humbled himself every morning before God's word until he realizes his own sinfulness. Then he looked up and could see the beauty of Jesus. The very message that offended his hearers is the very source of his strength of perseverance. For him, the knowledge of his own sin pulls him down into the waters like the ballast of a ship. And this prevents him to become arrogant, helping him to avoid the temptations of life. But at the same time, the grace of Jesus pulls him upwards like the buoyancy of water, preparing, pre preventing him from sinking into despair. So together, these two forces, they prevent a ship from being capsized and you can sail through the storms of life. So the knowledge of us, the next slide, being sinners prevent us from being arrogant and judgmental. At the same time, the knowledge of us being saints by grace, we are also saints, prevents us from sinking into despair. So together, the Word of God, when you read humbly, it produces a unique combination of humility 
and confidence. Humility in your own state and confidence in Christ's strength. And so only through Jesus can we have the endurance to die to ourselves and endurance to do God's will. And brothers and sisters, here is one good soil that the seed fell on, who hears the word, retains it, and by persevering, produce a crop. And may we also persevere in retaining God's word in our hearts with patient endurance. Verse 18, Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more, and whoever does not have, even what they think they have, will be taken from them. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, now that we have heard your word of life, soften our hearts, plant your word deep into our hearts so that we will bear fruit, fruit of repentance from sins, fruit of dependence on you, and fruit of perseverance in doing your will. And so that by our lives and our words, it will be a demonstration, not of our own strength or power, but by the Spirit's power, the Spirit's truth and grace. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.